Right. So, so for example, here's an example of a, of a thing that I realized. So one of the surprising things about, well, the two surprising facts about math. One is that it's hard, and the other is that it's doable. Okay? So first question is, why is math hard? You know, you've got these axioms, they're very small. Why can't you just solve every problem in math easily? Yeah, it's just logic. Right. right. Yeah. Well, logic happens to be a particular special case that does have certain simplicity to it. Um, but general mathematics, even arithmetic, already doesn't have the simplicity that logic has. So why is it hard? Because of computational irreducibility. Right. Uh, because what happens is, to know what's true, and this is this whole story about the path you have to follow and how long is the path, and Gödel's theorem is the statement there could be an infinite, that the path is not a bounded length, but the fact that the path is not always compressible to something tiny is a story of computational irreducibility. So that's, that's why math is hard. Now, the next question is, why is math doable? Because it might be the case that most things you care about don't have finite length paths. Most things you care about might be things where you get lost in the sea of computational irreducibility and worse, undecidability. That is, there's just no finite length path that gets you there. Um, you know, why is mathematics doable? You know, Gödel proved his incompleteness theorem in 1931. Most working mathematicians don't really care about it. They just go ahead and do mathematics, even though it could be that the questions they're asking are undecidable. It could have been that Fermat's last theorem is undecidable. It turned out it had a proof. It's a long, complicated proof. The twin prime conjecture might be undecidable. The Riemann hypothesis might be undecidable. These things might be, the axioms of mathematics might not be strong enough to reach those statements. It might be the case that depending on what axioms you choose, you can either say that's true or that's not true. So, and, and by the way, from Ra's last theorem, there could be a shorter path. Absolutely. Yeah, so that, the, the notion of geodesics in metamathematical space is the notion of shortest proofs in metamathematical space. And that's a, you know, human mathematicians do not find shortest paths, yeah. nor do automated theorem provers. Um, but the fact, and, and by the way, the, I mean, this stuff is so bizarrely connected. I mean, if, you, if you're into automated theorem proving, there are these so-called critical pair lemmas in automated theorem proving. Those are precisely the branch pairs in our, um, that in multi-way graphs. Let me just finish on the why mathematics is doable. Oh, right? yes, the second part. So right, which is, we know why it's hard. Why is it doable? Right. Why do we not just get lost in undecidability all the time? Yeah. Um, so, and, and here's another fact, is in doing computer experiments and doing experimental mathematics, you do get lost in that way. When you just say, I'm picking a random integer equation, how do I, does it have a solution or not? And you just pick it at random without any human sort of path getting there. Often, it's really, really hard. It's really hard to answer those questions. We just pick them at random from the space of possibilities. But what's, what I think is happening is, and that's a case where you just fell off into this ocean of sort of irreducibility and so on. What's happening is human mathematics is a story of building a path. You, you started off, you're, you're always building out on this path where you are proving things. You, you, you've got this proof trajectory, and you're basically, the human mathematics is the sort of, the exploration of the world along this proof tra trajectory, so to speak. You're not, you're not just, you know, uh, parachuting in from, from, you know, from, from anywhere. You're following, you know, Lewis and Clark or whatever. You're actually, yeah. you're actually going, the, you know, walk doing the, the path. Yeah. And the fact that you are constrained to go along that path is the reason you don't end up with lot. Every so often, you'll see a little piece of undecidability, and you'll avoid that that part of the path. But that's basically the story of why human mathematics has, has seemed to be doable. It's a story of exploring these paths that that are, by their nature, they have been constructed to be paths that can be followed, and so you can follow them further. Now, you know, wh why is this relevant to anything? So, okay, so here's the the my 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 belief. The fact that human mathematics works that way is, I think there's some sort of connections between the way that observers work in physics and the way that the axiom systems of mathematics are set up to make mathematics be doable in that kind of way. And so, in, in other words, in particular, I think there is an analog of causal invariance, which I think is, um, and this is again, in sort of the upper reaches of mathematics and, and stuff that, um, uh, it's a thing, there's this thing called homotopy type theory, which is an abstract, it came out of category theory, and it's sort of an abstraction of mathematics. 
Mathematics itself is an abstraction, but it's an abstraction of the abstraction of mathematics. And there is a thing called the univalence axiom, which is a sort of a, 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 a key axiom in that set of ideas. And I'm pretty sure the univalence axiom is equivalent to causal invariance. What was the term you used again? Uni univalence. Is that something for somebody like me accessible? Um, or is this... Uh, there's a statement of it that's fairly accessible. I mean, the statement of it is, um, uh, basically it says things which are equivalent can be considered to be identical. In which, but in which space? <laughs> yeah, it's it's in, in higher categories. Okay, in, so in it's, category it's, theory. Got okay, it. so it's it's yeah. a it's a. But I mean, the, the the thing just to give a sketch of how that works. So category theory is an attempt to idealize. It's an attempt to sort of have a formal theory of mathematics that is at a sort of higher level than mathematics. It's where where you just think think about these mathematical objects and these categories of objects and these these morphisms, these connections between categories. Okay, so it turns out the morphisms and categories, at least weak categories, are very much like the paths in our hypergraphs and things. And it turns out, again, this is this is where it all gets gets crazy. I mean it's it's the fact that these things are connected is just bizarre. Yeah. So category theory, uh, the our causal graphs are like second order category theory. And it turns out you can take the limit of infinite order category theory. So just give rough, roughly the idea. This is, a, this is a roughly explainable idea. So a mathematical proof will be a path that says you can get from this thing to this other thing. And here's the path that you get from this thing to this other thing. Mm -hmm. But in general, there may be many paths, many proofs that get you many different paths that all successfully go from this thing to this other thing. Okay. Now you can define a higher order proof which is a proof of the equivalence of those proofs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying there's a, they go, a path between those proofs, essentially. Uh, yes, a path between the paths. Yeah. Okay, and so you do that. That's the sort of second order thing. That path between the paths is essentially related to our causal graphs. Then ah, you can take the limit. Wow. Okay. The path between path between path between path. The infinite limit. That infinite limit turns out to be our Rulial multiway system. Yeah, the Rulio, the the Rulio multiway system. That's a fascinating thing, both in the physics world and and as you're saying. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's so so. Okay. I'm not sure I've loaded it all in completely, but well, uh, I'm not sure I have either. And it may be <laughs> one of these things where where you know, in another another five years or something, it's like this was obvious, but I didn't see it. No, but it, the thing which is sort of interesting to me is that there's sort of an upper reach of of mathematics of the abstraction of mathematics. Um, this thing, there's this mathematician called Grothendieck, who's generally viewed as being sort of one of the most abstract, sort of creator of the most abstract mathematics of 1970s-ish time frame. Um, and one of the things that he constructed was this thing he called the infinity groupoid. Um, and he has this sort of hypothesis about the inevitable appearance of geometry from essentially logic in the structure of this thing. Well, it turns out this Rulial multiway system is the infinity groupoid. So it's a it's this limiting object, and this is an this is an instance of that limiting object. So what to me is, I mean, again, I, I've been always afraid of this kind of mathematics because it seemed incomprehensibly abstract to me. Um, but what's what's what I'm sort of excited about with this is that that we've sort of concretified the way that you can reach this kind of mathematics which makes it, uh, well, both seem more relevant and also the fact that that, you know, I, I don't yet know exactly what mileage we're going to get from using the sort of the apparatus that's been built in those areas of mathematics to analyze what we're doing. But the thing uh, that's... Uh, so both ways, so using yeah, the right. mathematics to understand what you're doing and using right, what so, you're doing computationally to understand that mathematics. Right, so, so for example, the, the understanding of uh, metamathematical space, one of the reasons I really want to do that is because I want to understand quantum mechanics better. And and that, what you see, you know, we live that uh, kind of the multi-way graph of mathematics because we actually know this is a theorem we've heard of. This is another one we've heard of. We can actually say these are actual things in the world that we relate to, which we can't really do as, as readily for the, the physics case. And so it's kind of a way to help my intuition. It's also, you know, there are bizarre things like the, what's the analog of Einstein's equations in metamathematical space? What's the analog of a black hole? You know, it turns out it looks like, not completely sure yet, 
but there's this notion of non-constructive proofs in mathematics. And I think those relate to, well, actually the, the, they're, uh, they relate to things and uh, related to event horizons. Um, so the fact that you can take ideas from physics, like event horizons. And map them into the same uh, kind of space them, and map it's, it's really- So do you think there'll be, do you think you might stumble upon some breakthrough ideas in theorem proving? Like for from the the other direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, wh what's really nice is that we are using so this this absolutely directly maps to theorem proving. So paths and multi way graphs. That's what a theorem prover is trying to do. But that's I also good. mean like like automated theorem proving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's what right. So the finding of paths, the finding of shortest paths, or finding of paths at all is what automated theorem provers do. And actually, what what we've been doing, so we've you know we've actually been using automated theorem proving both in the physics project to prove things, and using that as a way to understand multi-way graphs. And the, because what an automated theorem prover is doing is it's trying to find a path through a multi-way graph, mm -hmm. and its critical pair lemmas are precisely little stubs of branch pairs going off into branchial space. And that's, I mean, it's really weird. And, you know, we have these visualizations in Wolfram language of our, of, of um, proof graphs from our automated theorem proving system. And, and they and, look reminiscent of- Well, uh, it's just bizarre because we made these up a few years ago <laughs> yeah. and they have these little triangle things uh, yeah. and they are, they are we, we didn't quite get it right. We didn't quite get the analogy perfectly right, but it's very close.